Hello and welcome to Ask Lovecraft After Dark. This is our 22nd episode and tonight I am incredibly honored to be joined by a good friend of mine and brilliant author Christy Demeester. Christy, oh welcome. Goodness. Thank you so much for having me and for saying nice lovely. Well, because I never get to hear nice things. It feels so nice. <laughs> I'm glad I can say some nice things for you, Christy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Christy and I got to know each other because she came on Miskatonic Musings, my uh, old uh, horror podcast, and instead of talking about her wonderful collection Split Tongues, I wasted about the first half of that episode just talking about Jim Henson's funeral, so that's not going to happen again this time, Christy. I promise we will actually talk about your work unless you have some thoughts about Big Bird singing It Ain't Easy Being Green. I think I've exhausted all muppet related anything because I, I honestly i think the second time that i went on we talked about it again i just you know i like keeping tradition alive that's all you know i want to i want to keep you on brand right right and apparently muppets is where it's at so but no i i have no more opinions about oscar the grouch or you know i, I think i'm good i think i'm good that is fair you know i i thought not to just make this about the muppets but i thought that i would watch a lot more like sesame street and muppets and stuff with my daughter than i do i think muppet christmas carol is about the only thing that really like shows up a lot uh right you know and god here i go again i'm about to talk about it but the muppet christmas carol i had not watched it in years, I mean, since I was probably ten or eleven, and we rewatched it this year. It, it, the Ghost of Christmas Past, the one that has some a little girl, yes, with the 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 face that is oddly human, but she has this odd voice, and I, it was so ter deeply, <laughs> deeply terrifying as an adult. Yes. I don't remember being <laughs> that horrified as a kid. No, but no, as an adult, no, it had some uncanny valley weirdness. Oh, it's not good. Ooh. It's just meant to terrify. Um, right. And they managed to, I, I because I'm a giant nerd, uh, and and sat through the entire director's commentary, they <laughs> did that by, like, because they tried to have the, the puppet in water, and it just, like, sank or something. Like, it didn't do well. So it was in, like, petroleum jelly or oil or something. Oh. Like, that's why it's got that, like, viscous sort of movement. That makes it so much worse. Ooh, yeah. That, right? that, that one gave me the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So there we go. That's it. That's all Muppets. We're if done. If any other Muppets show up, it's not our fault. No, so no. Uh, we are here to talk about Christie's wonderful books. Um, I just finished reading Beneath, which was absolutely terrifying and delightful in oh, equal measure. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, uh, Christy and I both grew up in fairly religious backgrounds, environments, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's a hundred percent accurate. Yes. <laughs> uh, I don't. I'm not going to say that. And we've and we're both uh, children of the South. Um, I'm not going to say that my religious experience uh, matched what was in <laughs> beneath. <laughs> uh, I I think I can safely say uh, it was not the Southern Baptists for all their foibles were not quite uh, so intense. Uh, but uh, there was still a lot to recognize, <laughs> like just that kind of way of thinking and almost guardedly and biblically, like just you sort of have to like put on the armor of the Lord by having these sort of Bible verses at hand and these references at hand when you sort of engage. And then when you let down your kind of guard to have real un like conversations that really connect with people, it's terrifying and you- Oh, yes capture that really well. So tell us, tell us about how uh, you managed to bring that into the book. Well, and it's interesting that you bring up that, like letting the guard down and having this really terrifying moment of engaging with what is what in my, when in my childhood, we called the world and, <laughs> That's uh, right. and every, the world was dangerous and that the world was sinful and, and a scary place. And so a lot of the background and the in, the inspiration for Beneath was 100% my childhood. And now granted, I, there, the supernatural stuff, you know, you know, there were no demon snakes writhing up from the ground to take over the world. But of that, those, those experiences in the church and the rigidity and the, the guilt and the shame and the fear, that was all 100% it, what I experienced. And so there, the, this was probably one of the only times or <laughs> one of the first times that I really let myself go back to that really dark place that I was in when I was younger of um, guilt and shame 
that I grew up with. And so it was 100% pulled just from, from being a kid and having that as my daily experience. Well, and you you managed to capture the view from a couple different perspectives. So, you know, so for folks at home who have not read this book, you should. Uh, you've already been spoiled that there's sort of giant snake things trying to take over the world. Um, but what's really fascinating about it is the different character perspectives. We essentially have I'd, three to four perspectives that we're following. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, sort of an older woman who's part of this religious community, her daughter, the pastor, and then a reporter coming into this community who has her own religious baggage and right, right. <laughs> terrible experiences that she's bringing to bear. Um, but it's it's really it's interesting when you know when you talk about the guilt and you talk about those that 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 fear. The character that seems to express the most of that is the pastor, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is really really creepy and really cool and that and that idea i mean i think we've seen in in media you know the sort of the the hypocritical pastor who doesn't actually believe in a sort of con man and that's you almost go there but not quite like like there is still this kind of like core like he's still in that world um and again i think those instincts are still there right he's still not a man of the world you know right right even if he doesn't necessarily have that same faith that his parents had um, and so I found that really interesting and I'm, I'm curious about sort of how you kind of threaded that needle of not going so cliche, but also like making like, I think a real experience of folks who are in this world and are so far in it, there's sort of no way out, even when they kind of know none of it's real. Right. Right. And that was something that with his character, I, I wanted him, I knew from the beginning that I wanted him to be a charlatan and that he understood what it was that he was selling to his to his congregation um but that, that at the same time even though he knows that he's selling something and even though he knows that a lot of it is farce there's a part of him that still so desperately wants to be redeemed and so desperately wants to be not saved necessarily but to be not seen as a terrible person and so there's still that want, that very small component of faith embedded within the way that he views the world and the, the, the itch that the sin, the, the, this itchiness that the sin gives him is something he wants to shrug off so badly, but he, but he can't. And so I, I didn't want to make him swarmy or, you know, like hand wringing and, oh, I'm going to get these guys. I, I didn't want any of that. <laughs> um, because and, and I, he's he's not and this is something too it, he's not a good guy no and no. he's not a good guy <laughs> he's actually he's he's a terrible terrible person but there is i wanted there to be this one humanizing component of him in that he recognizes that he's not and that there is some sorrow attached to that and there is some regret attached to the fact that he's not a good person but that he does it anyway and i think that when i was starting to think about the differences between sin and redemption and salvation and just being a person of we sin all the time and we make mistakes all of the time but that the when you carry them with you for so long, when you carry the guilt over doing these small things for so long, how that can ultimately impact a person and how you can hide it. And so I, I, I never, I never wanted him to be blatantly awful, but that he's, it's simmering. It, well, and that, it, that, that yeah, there. I mean, every, there's a lot of baggage in a lot of these characters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And no one is clear cut. No, I mean, and, and, you know, I think there's a lot of, it, there's a lot of questions about like sort of innocence and guilt that play out, um, you know, sort of sins of the forebears, you know, we see that kind of crop up a lot. And this relationship between parents and children, a lot of mothers and daughters, yeah, <laughs> you know, sort yeah. of coming up. Um, I, one thing I, I wanted though, to sort of get at logistically use, uh, this book takes place in sort of the, I think late sixties, early seventies, and then mid eighties. Is that correct? That's right. Mm-hmm why like 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 there's no like like reagan doesn't show up like you know the the americans aren't uh you know special guests in this so i was trying to sort of like as i was reading i was wondering is this just so she doesn't have to worry about cell phones because i get that i can appreciate 
Right. Uh, but I was I was really interested why you said it in I think eighty six is when the sort of the real action right. takes place. And I, I wanted so already when dealing with this particular fundamentalist religion, there is a sense of claustrophobia because there isn't going to be a lot of access to technology uh, because that was how I grew up. Of we weren't given any kind of access to technology. There were no televisions. Um, if we had radio, it was it had to be approved. It, had, it could be secular music. Of um, the, our our reading was limited. And so contact with the outside world was already almost non-existent. And you lived in this really insular world. And so I knew in getting Cora to Hensley, getting her to this town, it was going to be cut off from any kind of outside civilization. And so there was a note of, I wanted to take that feeling and heighten it of that true sense of 100% isolation of not just does this community not have access to these things, but the likelihood of the information of what's happening in this town being disseminated is going to slow down even more. And that it cre it just exacerbates this feeling of claustrophobia and not being able to know or understand if this is happening just here, is it happening everywhere? Is it rippling outward? Like what exactly is going on to kind of close in that town and make what's happening a little more frightening. Well, an interesting thing that keeps happening is the characters do leave the town, but then they always get drawn back. Like there's this sort right. of like, like they get in their car and they head out and they go to the diner and then they're like, mm, nope, go, we're going to nope on back. And then like, oh, we're going to go to the gas station. And, and, and then, and so there's that, that weird, not just claustrophobia, but almost like a sense of just inevitability. Like you just you right. cannot, escape even though they're right. they've got they've got their hands on the wheel like they literally can go um and you're not you know bending space time and like you know they go down the highway and oh we're back where, <laughs> we're we, started. Right back where we started <laughs> right and that was something that um i knew would probably irritate certain readers of that there was this feeling of stop start stop start of well, why can't they just get out of the freaking town of like, go leave of that doesn't make any sense. But I, I did want this sense of this, of a drawback of that they can't of, there is some kind of compelling thing that's pulling them back. And ultimately, isn't that kind of, Oh God, I'm going to get real English teachery. I am so sorry. <laughs> no, please um, do. Of, and isn't that how sin works? You try to leave it and you can't. And um, all of these things that we try to ignore um, and say, no, this, this is, I, I'm going to, I'm going to bury all of these terrible things, the terrible parts of myself, the things I want to forget, the, the parts of my life that I wish had never happened, you bury it, but it always is going to come back up. And so there was a part of me, I wanted them to, to not be able to leave for some reason. And, you know, people read it and they go, oh, why can't, again, to get out of the shit, just get out of the town. And <laughs> just go already. <laughs> right, right. And um, why keep coming back? But that there that felt right to me of that it's one of those things you can't, you, they can't, they can't physically do it because everything comes back. Here's my, my other, yep. <laughs> I was gonna say there's my lit teacher explanation. There we go, I'll take it. <laughs> well, my my other thought for why you said in the 80s was so there would still be print journalism to you know create a reason for <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, and she needed and she needed a reason to physically go there. Um, not just Skype in, not just watch videos on YouTube. Um, because there is a very there's a stark difference of physically being in that in a in a handling service like that versus watching it. Um because you know, I've I I'd gone, I went to them, I went to snake handling services when I was a kid, and it, it's not the same as watching it. Uh, it's a different feeling of you can, it, it is a distinct energy in the crowd that cannot be replicated. Um, and so she needed to be there. Talk, talk a bit more about that, that energy. You know, I, you know, I grew up Southern Baptist and, you know, definitely can remember the sort of the, the excitement and energy of going to like youth conferences and like, oh, yeah. you know, like, you know, Lord, I lift your name on high, <laughs> you know, like. Everyone's you know, singing just, jars of clay. <laughs> that's right. Uh, you know. Uh, just, you know, you are the devil and the devil is bad. You know, like there just has that kind of, you know, just youth, just a bunch of really worked up teens that aren't uh, allowed to send with each other. So there's just that <laughs> kind of like really focused kind of tension that's going on. Um, but, 
you know, I've seen Jesus camp and I've seen, I've, I've heard from, you know, like Pentecostal friends, you know, folks who, you know, go to places where there is glossolalia and there yeah. is, you know, like, we're going to have some fruits of the spirits here tonight, you know, right. like for all that the Southern Baptists were very sort of jazzed up in certain ways, they're still very sort of stayed and buttoned up and, you know, like, mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm I'm interested in both your personal experience of that that very specific kind of uh, of energy and how you were able to kind of parlay and work that into uh, a story about murderous worm creatures <laughs> and children. Um, is, I think probably the best word I can use to describe that is is um, f fervor is the word that I want to use, but at the same time, and I, I feel like it may be ex exaggerating a little bit, but not really is hysteria of there is a pervasive sense of just the hysterical. And the, like you said, the glossolalia, um, women fainting, um, men needing, having, having so much energy, they needed to physically run up and down the church aisles. Um, screaming um and i think probably my, my biggest memory and this is where i think and i was very young i we were we were in the church from the time i was five until i was 11 and 10 or 11 and it was um it was all that hysteria was also about gathering attention of that you wanted people to see you as chosen by god or or as touched by God or important in some capacity. And so when the glossolalia would happen, there would always be someone who was anointed by God to do an interpretation of that message because it was, you know, vo the voice of God is speaking directly through you. And then also then there's someone there who will do this interpretation. And I, I vividly remember doing an interpret. I was probably six, six or seven, vividly remember doing an interpretation. I had no idea what I was talking about, but I wanted the attention so badly that I just said stuff and then just basked in all of the godly attention of this child. Oh, is, well, this child from, the is tongue, from the tongue of babes, right? I mean, like, yeah, that, that pressure. I mean, I'm, and I, I can think, you know, the closest thing I can remember for being a kid in, in the mission field is that like, you know, those kind of group prayers were kind of, there's sort of everyone is kind of around each other and you sort of feel this pressure like I need to pray something but like I don't know if I want to like pray thing or the um the altar calls I mean that's the big sort of thing that right, you have that, right. that that pressure to have you know to make your public affirmation of faith or your your reaffirming uh you know public declaration you know that kind of stuff but even that for all that it's like weird sort of like I can I can almost sort of break that down and think about that sociologically about you know peer pressure and you know like this perform you know pressure to perform and whatnot but this like there I feel like there's something and a different kind of undercurrent at work here that's that's intense and it's it's ter obviously terrifying from a secular point of view um but is very much like a real lived experience. Like it's not right. fake, right? Like, I mean, you right. know, yeah, as a kid, you're sort of like, uh, uh, I saw, you know, Goody Walter with the devil in the <laughs> sunlight, you know, right, um, right, right. but, but I mean, it's th those feelings are real and like, and they can, they, right. And then they can manifest as, as real visions or real or real true experiences of and again i think yeah I, I'm, I'm just gonna stick with it i think hysteria is the best word because when we would go to some of these tent revivals and that was something that even within beneath even though we never well we do see a service and um and that's that first one where uh she's bitten by the snake and but that sense of every of not just the pressure but the the absolute belief can create a, a truly manifested vision of um throwing I we would go to revival services and we watched demons get thrown out of people and I had myself convinced for years that I'd seen it happen of uh, because you tell yourself that evil is real and that it physically walks in the world and so I should be able to see it and that belief becomes so deeply entrenched that you start to see it and I've I've had theories before too of you know when I think about um 
the prevalence of uh, possession stories within the Catholic Church of, you know, why is every possession movie about, you know, the Catholic Church of like, why isn't it any other religion? Like, why can't we get a nice Episcopalian possession or, you know? <laughs> well, no, here's why you can't do Episcopalian <laughs> possession. And this is a joke that my wife appreciates is because, you know, instead of like the power of Christ compels you, it would be uh, the power of Christ invites you to our adult continuing education program. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, the, power you of like Christ, uh, the power of Christ offers you some fine cherry. Yes. Would you <laughs> like to, perhaps you would like to come, you know, oh like, like, you know, Ang Anglican exorcists are just like, now, Mr. Vampire, you know what you're doing <laughs> is very unpleasant. And I don't think we should be carrying on with that now, should we? Mm -hmm. Don't you? Um, now, if you'd like to join our, our regular vestry meeting and then vampire leaves because they're getting inundated with emails about, you know, 15 different committees. Like that's that's how we <laughs> keep things demon free uh, in oh the Episcopal gosh. world. Oh, that's well, hysterical. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, I think the I think there are two really great demon possession movies. I think Fallen is fantastic, um, mm. uh, but Frailty. I feel yes. like Frailty captures that small town like homegrown pastor feel right. of of like they're they're demons and we got to deal with them boys and if you got right. if those of you in the chat have not seen frailty get on that it is fantastic it that movie blew my mind and i didn't see it until i was older but, and people told me again you have to watch frailty um people who knew my background of like you have to watch it and it hit so many of the right notes because that that was the thing as I was as I was even as I was writing to beneath if I'm going I, I need to have these people believe this so much that it becomes a physical possibility that you see these things and these things can happen and <laughs> and and it just so happens in this book that it does but you believe it so much and it physically manifests. Now it's I mean it's interesting right you know we grew up in in traditions that where demons were really sort of spoken of in, <laughs> in real ways. Um, when it came time to actually sort of populate your book with monsters, like were you sort of going back to those wells or, you know, like what the creatures in this are, are interesting because they're so vague for so long. And then towards the end, we begin to see, I think a bit more like, oh, okay, so this is where they're coming from. Like you start doing some name dropping, which I won't get to. Uh, <laughs> um, but but yeah, I'm interested in sort of the source for that and kind of where your head was at as you were kind of planning this out and thinking about what's what is literally beneath. Right, uh, snakes is where I started. <laughs> I mean, fair fair enough. They do feature very prominently. right, very heavily. <laughs> Um, any, and I have been terrified for snakes my entire life for a multitude of reasons, um, but largely because of the associations with uh, the Garden of Eden and that the snake was the ultimate symbolic representation of evil and of the devil. And so when I started to think about uh, not just this, this community within Appalachia that was snake handling, but what the snake ultimately represented to me as I was growing up, it started there. And then that was just a hop, skip, and a jump away to tuber worms. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever they are. <laughs> Whatever they are. Uh, but these worm-like entities that that exist. And so I, I feel like I'm spoiling. They're creatures. It's mentioned on the back of the book. I'm not spoiling anything. It's called Beneath. You know, right. like right. <laughs> it's not Care Bears, folks. Right. No. And so, but I also with the with that title and with the fact that the the creatures live under the ground or were under the ground, and again, so much of that is drawn from the symbolism of my past of that evil evil was beneath us, of that you that hell was a place and it was under our feet. You you could it is there. <laughs> what was it? Oh shoot! What movie? Easy A. When uh, Fred Armisen. <laughs> oh no! It's real. It's there. It's under our feet. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and so when I started to think about um, just contextualizing the physical space of where these things would come from, I went, it's, it's got to be out of the ground. Because to me, uh, when I think about everything that is under us, that's terrifying. The oceans, the dirt, the, the concept of things growing freaks me out. I don't know why. It's really scary to me when I think that there's a sentient thing you can put it in the ground and it will come to life. 
I mean, I think, I mean, I feel like they've calculated that like the biomass of what's beneath, I mean, even just like microbial, like is more than the biomass on the surface. Like there's right. just a lot down there. And right. as stuff melts and we keep finding giant caves in Antarctica, we're just going to keep finding more things. Isn't the worm? Yeah, we, we dug this worm out and then it came back to life. <laughs> After 40,000 years. Yeah. 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 Let's Good just job. Leave it guys. Alone. <laughs> right. Um, and so the, a lot of that just had was drawing on my childhood fears of the things that were underneath us, childhood associations with evil stuff being underneath us. And so when I started to think, well, where my monsters need to come from, the dirt was the dirt was the best spot. I mean, I think kids know, like kids go digging. I was a digger, you know, like the d dirt's where you find good stuff. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Did, did you go spelunking as a kid at all or? No, we never, I, I never, I never did a lot of cave work, um, as a kid, but I, I was a, I was a big digger. <laughs> um, <laughs> there wasn't, there wasn't much to do in the Pentecostal religion when you were a child, you could read or you could go outside. Oh, and, they, uh, they, they allowed, they allowed lady folk to read while wow, progressive. <laughs> oh, we, we were really killing it. Um, and so it was either I was outside and I'm, I'm not a big, I wasn't ever an outside kid. And so I, I, I gravitated toward reading, but my mother would shove me outdoors and I would steal her spoons and I would dig in the dirt. <laughs> and, how, <laughs> and how many uh, snakes did you uh, unearth this in this manner? <laughs> Didn't unearth any snakes, but I unearthed a lot of worms. And I think that that again was where a lot of my fear came from of even of earthworms because and just the the bodies uh, were so the and the movement is so unnatural. Well, and we had where where I grew up in West Africa, we would have like especially after rainstorm these like weird columns where like worms Ooh. would like would like create these like just strange little columns like they would I guess to get out of the earth oh. and whatnot. So you would just you know you would see and they would dry. So you would find these like just little kind of almost fingers sticking up. <laughs> um, oh out of uh out of the ground and you know you would you know you'd be trying to like grab it and try to get the worm before it went it like you know went back into the ground you know so, uh, kids played all sorts of fun cruel games um oh yeah oh yeah but yeah no nature is weird and gross and there are t billions of monsters under our feet that's have, absolutely yay have a great night everyone <laughs> bye <laughs> right don't don't excavate anything at your house because <laughs> you're gonna find something now I, I do have to note that you've written this book beneath and and then you've got a collection, Christy, that is called Everything That's Underneath. So obviously <laughs> we we gotta talk about this. What are you okay? What's happening? I know. I, I went through a phase. Uh, <laughs> I went through a phase of exploring my my concerns with things that were um hidden and um, in the ground. Okay, okay. And I did not intend for that to happen, that the, 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 the titles would be so incredibly similar and, you know, shame on me, maybe I should have gotten a little bit more creative, but I, uh, when I went to go looking for the title for the collection, um, it the title story just, it seemed to fit the best. And I, I oh God, I wrote lists and lists and lists. Of, <laughs> I, I was looking up all kinds of things of and, and just nothing felt right. And I was like, okay, I guess this works. And then I went, oh God, it's just like the book title. Oh. <laughs> At some and, point you just need well, to turn something in. <laughs> right. And I, and I went, you know what? Oh, well, it's, I, you know, I'm a nerd. I'm a nerd. Okay. I like things. That are under the, okay. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I, I hope though that in the future there'll be different titles that don't have to do with earth <laughs> or dirt. So look, hey, brand management is about finding out what people like and just like digging down, you know. Right, in your absolutely. case, in your case, literally digging. Literally digging down. Yes, I have a brand. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, so tell us about this collection. Uh, is it a, a fair amount of mostly original stuff, or is it things that have been published? Kind of, how did you go about putting this together? So everything that's underneath is. I, a majority of things that had been previously published. And then there are a handful or maybe three uh, original stories. And then one, or, there's an original novelette in there, which is Birthright. And so when I started to think about it and pitch it, I wanted to pick the stories from, and th these are stories from more of the beginning of, of my writing career that were, that I really loved or that I was the most proud of. And so there are certainly stories out there 
in 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 uh, my my canon that are not in the collection for a reason because they are terrible. Um, but that I want I wanted something that I was really proud of. And so there's uh, yeah three I think that are original, including the novelette. But most of them had been previously published. But some of them had been published in um, mag uh, magazines that were had a very limited run or had a very limited readership. So most of them had been in places they just may not have been seen. And as you were cobbling it together, did you have a theme beyond these are stories I like? <laughs> right. Um, I, I, as I was looking at it and as we were looking at the order, and again, I noticed a lot of like the mother daughter relationship stuff or just family relationship stuff. And so I wanted to put them, those thematic things kind of together so that we went from relationships with a significant other into siblings, into mothers and daughters, and kind of following the trajectory of that. So really it's a, that collection, that's my relationship collection of um, people, people being people and being nasty to each other. Yay. Yay. Or outside things being nasty. Yeah. So that it's, it's the relationship collection, um, right. which I mean, I guess all, everything's a relationship when you really get down to it. <laughs> but if, that it was particularly focused on families. All right. I like it. I dig it. A lot of families are underneath. That's for true. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah. Uh, we're going to uh, take a, a quick break for our very first uh, commercial promotion. I don't even know how to Yay. even describe it. So uh, for those of you who are following us uh, on the uh, Facebook group, uh, you will know that uh, we had uh, Brian and Gwen Callahan of uh, Arkham Bazaar and of the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival. They are delightful, wonderful people, and they, in their generosity, donated a whole whack load of these absolutely gorgeous pins. I will try not to get completely caught in the glare. Um, <laughs> they're from their uh, Kickstarter Cthulhu Mythos pin collection and one special yellow sign pin. These things are hefty, they are gorgeous, and with a little bit of luck, they're gonna be yours. So, <laughs> The way this is going to work, sorry, Christy, uh, you are unfortunately unable to to play this time around. But next um, episode, maybe maybe you can try your hand. All right. Uh, those of you at home watching, please do send in an email if you are interested in winning one of those. And if you're in the continental United States, sorry, Canada, I'm betraying betraying my decade living in you. Um, uh, I would like you to send an email to uh, asklovecraft at gmail dot com. Uh, with the subject line, Christy Demeester, your Woo! best spelling of that. And uh, I would like you to give me your name, your address, uh, mailing address, and what animal you would choose to use if you had to incorporate animals in your creepy religious practice. So there we go. <laughs> That's the show that you've actually been watching this uh, show and aren't just spamming my... It was so spooky, these pins, that they broke my internet, guys. <laughs> That's what happened. Not awful rural Ohio internet happened. No, no, not at all. Uh, so if you do that, once again, that, uh, send in an email to asklovecraft at gmail.com, subject line Christy Demeester, and tell me your name, your mailing address, and what animal life you would incorporate in your various religious practice. You don't need to tell me how. I don't want you guys to be weird and gross. I don't want to like have to be thinking about stuff like that when I'm, you know, sending you nice things. Just, you know, give me an animal. That's all. Don't make it weird, guys. Don't please, please. I have children. Don't make it weird. Right. Uh, back to the show. Uh, so Christy, uh, beyond this, you've uh, worked, I know, with, uh, you had some publications through Dim Shores. Uh, you had a limited run with Split Tongues. Uh, yes. What else uh, have you put out there in the world? And is a lot of that now into everything that's uh, underneath? Or have you kept sort of a widespread? Uh, been a little bit of a widespread. So since everything that's underneath has come out, I've had, um, well, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, chat book that I did with uh, Tall Hout Press. And um, Eve's, if I say his, I'm going to say his last name wrong. And I hate Tori nope. me. 
It's not right. I have no idea. Eve's touring me a T O U R I G N E Y. He's a wonderful illustrator and um, did a limited chapbook with him called Unmemory. It's a, uh, it was Christmas themed. It was about a bad, bad Santa. So I was Ooh. really excited and it's illustrated. It's really, really cool. So um, if you go to the Tall Hat Press website, there should still be some copies left. That was really, really a lot of fun. Um, and then last year, had some stories in a handful of anthologies, um, Lost Highways from Crystal Lake Publishing, um, Lost Films, had a story in there, had a story just come out in January in Black Static. Um, there was, I had a story in Pseudopod last year. Uh, so there, there's been a sprinkling of things here and there and um, and wait, waiting to hear on a couple of things so far for 2019. But the short story front has been, was really rich over the past couple of years. So I feel very lucky to have been able to been, be in some really awesome places. Oh, I got a story in fairy tale review last year, which was really Ooh. fun. Uh, I it was my first foray into not spooky. Well, it was still a spooky story, but not <laughs> spooky Fair. publication. So that was a really, really, really cool. And I, I was excited to have a story there. Oh, that sounds incredibly awesome. Yeah. I mean, most of your work, I mean, most like, most of the people we interview on this show, their things they have written the most are short stories. Um, the process, though, for actually putting together a novel, how mm. going into that, talk talk to us about that and the, and the sort of the the trials and tribulations you experienced. I am deep inside of this process right now. So I am currently working on, let's see here, round five of edits on um, a novel for my agent. So this has been, I have stitched, unstitched, and then restitched this novel so many times now, I don't even recognize anything anymore. <laughs> of, I, I'll read a sentence and I, I will have no idea if I actually wrote it or not. I'll go, I think that's mine. I don't remember anymore <laughs> physically writing that. Um, you, but you get to a point of delirium almost. Uh, this is probably the most intensive experience that I've gone through is editing this second novel. Um, but it is very different. And I learned after Beneath and then going into the second novel, I had always been a pantser. I, I, I did not like going in with a plan. I didn't like having any idea really of what was going to happen. I had to take watching. a moment to figure out what you meant by pantser. I realized, you know, I mean, seat of the pantser and not you're like pulling just, people's drawers down. Yeah, I run up to poor unsuspecting people and just show everyone I mean, their weenies. That's that's one way to write books. <laughs> it, it's guess. not a great way, but you could in theory. Um, but I, I never liked to outline or plan. And then when I went into the second book, I did the same thing. And then I got to the end of it and I sent it out to some beta readers and they were very confused. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> as they rightfully should have been because it was a pile of shit. And sat down with it and then and went, went at it again, sent it back out. And then got some, finally got a little nibble from an agent who said, you have good writing, but your the story is not making sense in a lot of places. You need to outline. And I went, damn it, you're right. <laughs> and so <laughs> sat down, outlined, redid it, sent it out again, <laughs> finally landed an agent. And, th and I thought, oh, here, here's the Calvary. We're ready to go. I'm so excited. No, girl. Mm-mm. It's still pl it's plenty to be done. And it is, it is a painstaking, it's a beautiful process. I'd rather do it than anything else, but it takes way more time and way more awareness of the many moving parts because it's, it's not many short stories strung together. I think a lot of writers get that in their head. If it's like, well, I can write a short story. Isn't a novel just writing like a lot of short stories all together? And no, because that one little thing that you maybe mentioned in chapter three, you have to know that that's going to show up again in chapter 11 and you have to know why they're connected and then where it's ultimately going to be leading. Otherwise, if you haven't planted those things throughout the entire text, the payoff isn't as good. And that's the biggest lesson I think that I've learned is like it really, I, maybe other people can do it. I have to plan it or those pieces don't make sense. And I, ooh, it grates on me, but I know I have to do it.
Yeah. And I guess, were you able to take any of your lessons from beneath into this or has it been essentially starting over from scratch? Uh, I think the biggest lesson that I learned from beneath was the need to sit down and do it. it just shut up, get out of my own way, sit down and do it and know that I can go back and fix it later. Um, I, ha I have that awful thing called perfectionism. Oh no, no, that's right. the worst thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> that awful thing called perfectionism where everything, I felt like everything had to be just right. And there, there are things in beneath I would fix, I would change now of, I, I look back at it and I cringe in a lot of places and go, Oh no, why would you do that? And, but to be okay and let, let it go. All will be fine. You can fix it later. That's the big lesson I took away from beneath. And also the big lesson that I took away from beneath was people do not like ambiguous endings. Uh, <laughs> okay. No comment. People, some people really do not like ambiguous endings. A lot of people say that about the short stories too, though. But that was the other big lesson from beneath. Um, but mostly just sit, get out of your own way and shut up and do it. There we go. Uh, we've got one question uh, based on a, a Kickstarter you contributed to. Uh, folks are, are curious to know when uh, Welcome to Miskatonic University is coming out. That's <gasps> okay. I have no I idea. Am, so, uh, I am so excited about that. <laughs> I am so excited about this story. I wish I had an exact date for that. I have been told that it is forthcoming at some point this year before summer. Um, I know that uh, there's been some issues of with, uh, and not any fault of the publisher, but um, you may have heard some rumblings about the nocturnal readers box. I have not. Oh dear. Okay, let me spill some tea for you. Okay, so there was a wonder, um, a horror subscription box, and it was a wonderful idea, and they sent out some great stuff, including my collection. Um, unfortunately, they neglected to pay a number of the publishers for their books and yes and unfortunately um broken eye books was one of those publishers and so uh, scott is unfortunately trying to recoup a lot of that loss and um, that has unfortunately pushed back a lot of his publication schedule and so i know that welcome to miskatonic university is forthcoming i just i and it's supposed to be this year i just unfortunately don't have any more knowledge about that but i'm really excited for that story because um that is my cthulhu cthulhu um in a sorority story what <laughs> Hold on. you're gonna have to go back so first off this is my first time hearing about uh welcome to miskatonic university so i'm gonna need to hear a little bit about yes. this and then we definitely yes. gonna need to talk about uh pledging cthulhu yes yes uh, so welcome to miskatonic university is an anthology all about um Lovecraft in college. Uh, so any anything and everything to do with any of the Lovecraft mythos but set within a university. And so my university experience had everything to do with being in um, a sorority where everybody treated each other like shit. And this, this, <laughs> you know, this checks was, out. Yeah, yeah. And so I, if I just went, okay, well, I, I have to write, now I have to write, um, a Lovecraft story in a sorority. I have to, there's no other option. And so the story is told exclusively through emails back and forth between the chapter members and the sorority president and some really weird stuff happens, but they're also wonderfully bitchy to each other. So that was, oh, I had so much fun with that story. And that was <laughs> That's a fantastic. That was a really fun one to write. <laughs> so hopefully this year, I, I am hoping. It'll be awesome. have you have you gotten involved with other Kickstarters before? Or is this kind of your first time sort of putting it into that and sort of I hope it makes it? Um, uh, yes, I have been involved in some Kickstarters in the past. Probably the most notable one was when Gamut um, was making that big, big, big push to be um, out in the world. I think that was a couple of years ago. I know they've since um, ceased publishing, but the mo the most recent one though was um, for Ashes and Entropy, which I have a story in. Um, why can't I remember the title of my own story? Oh, good grief. For our skin, a daughter. There we go. And um, that one has actually just recently released. So I, I try to, the, one, the the magazines or the anthologies that I am involved in to support them. But then um, even ones that I think are particularly, this looks really, really awesome. I want to try to throw a little bit of support behind it. And so there have been a handful over the years. And of course, now I'm blanking. Oh, um, there was an anthology a couple years back. Kurt Favre 
was involved in um, called Monsters Rebuilt. I don't think it ever quite got off the ground, but it, it looked really cool. And so I, I, I tried, tried to, when I see those, go, okay, let's get these out so we can get a little bit get more good horror fiction out there. Fantastic. That's really exciting. Yeah. Well, I'm really looking forward to more of your stuff coming out. I think the world yeah. can always use more Christina Meester. Oh, thank you. Uh, what should folks be on the lookout for in the next little while? Sure. Um, so I will have another story in Pseudopod coming very soon. Their Artemis Rising series, which is a focus on their female authors. Um, I will have a story with them shortly. Um, and then I will also have, I can't even remember the, the other things that are coming because there have been some things that have been simmering on the horizon for a little while. I have an essay coming in the second volume of Thinking Horror. Um, and I know that I, like I said, I just had the, um, oh my goodness, I cannot even think. I just had the story in Black Static, and I'm, I'm actually just pulling it up because my memory is so shot um, of exactly what's coming, so that that way I am not telling any stories out of school. Uh, oh, okay, I have a story coming in Three Love with Burning Eye called The Bee Queen, that will hopefully be coming. Oh, I, I have a um, The Twisted Book of Shadows, which is the anthology that Christopher Golden put together. I have a story coming in that this year um, called For Every Sin and Absolution. And I know I mentioned the Welcome to Miskatonic University. So, so far this year, that's about that's about all I've got. But that's a lot. Um, that's hopefully enough. some more. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited, yeah. And uh, are you going to be making any public appearances, any sort of like uh, signings or conventions, things like that? Oh, yes. I will be at the Outer Dark Convention uh, in Atlanta coming in March. And um, I will be there that Friday night and then that Saturday kind of through midday. Um, so I know that there's some great people who are coming to that. I know, um, I think Nadia Bolkin's going to be down there. And I'm really looking forward to meeting a lot of folks that I know online, but I've never met in person. That's always fun. Yeah. Well, thank you for meeting me online, despite of our technical course. difficulties. Uh, this has been an absolute blast. Uh, if folks want to find out uh, more about you, I believe they can go to christydemeester.com. That's right, christydemeester.com. That All right. That's the best spot. Um, and then I'm also on Twitter at kmdemeester. Fantastic. Uh, we are already starting to get some uh, wonderful entries in uh, for the pin contest. Uh, again, that's the pin contest that's been put out by our good friends. Oh, hello. And I'm about to lose my microphone. Our good friends at Arkham Bazaar and the HP Lovecraft Film Festival. Uh, folks have until, I'm going to say, I want to tell you until the end of Friday to get in their email. So we'll keep it for those of us in uh, the Appreciation Society. You have a chance to uh, get those emails in. I will choose randomly. It will be a fair, random way. PH won't in any way influence uh, my opinion on the matter. Uh, so definitely, uh, if you're interested in winning these, we're gonna keep running this. As long as I've got pens, I'm gonna keep doing this. So at least uh, for the next few months. Uh, so if you don't win this time, uh, try again uh, over the next uh, few weeks and months. Thank you all for watching. Thank you all for listening. Uh, I, of course, have been Lehman Kessler. Uh, if uh, you don't know what Ask Lovecraft is, uh, Ask Lovecraft is uh, my uh, tri-weekly program where I dress up as H.P. Lovecraft and answer questions for the internet because I thought that would be a good way to spend my time. Uh, and it has been. Uh, this is the As Lovecraft Appreciation Society uh, special show, uh, the As Lovecraft After Dark. If you want to be a part of the Appreciation Society, be able to uh, comment uh, live, uh, get uh, first crack at some of our fun contests, then just go to Facebook and join As Lovecraft Appreciation Society. It's a lot of fun. It's all very attractive, discerning people. You will have a good time. Uh, otherwise, you can find out about live shows. I've got some stuff coming up. I'm going to be in Canton, Ohio at the Odd Mall Expedition Elsewhere, uh, Sunday, February 17th. Uh, I'm going to be up at uh, Cleveland Concoction, just outside of Cleveland uh, at... Um, beginning of March, like March 1st to the 3rd. Uh, and if you happen to be in uh, rural Knox County, Ohio, uh, February 
8th, I believe, uh, you can see me uh, impersonating Peter Sellers for a local Chautauqua reading series. Uh, I believe those are all my current live shows that uh, folks can come out to see. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for supporting this show, for watching S. Lovecraft, for watching S. Lovecraft After Dark, for supporting us on Patreon. Uh, if you want to find out more about me, about my live shows, you can go to LehmanKessler.com. You can also just follow me screaming into the void over on Twitter at Lehman Kessler. Once again, thank you so much, Christy, for being on the show. And thank you for everyone for watching. Have an absolutely wonderful week, and we'll see you all next time. Bye.